check, 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 check. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it is a little bit tough, I know, because we've been, uh, you know, inundated with some great speakers and not a lot of breaks. So I will get you to um, help me uh, take this journey together uh, by doing a short show of hands. So hands up everybody here who owns land, manages land, invests money in that land, and expects that money to return. Okay. Hands up everybody here who uses soil testing. Okay, that's great. And hands up everybody here who actually has questions about the value that their soil tests generate. Let's be honest, people. The alternate uh, reality of this talk could be named why it is that soil tests suck and nobody wants to talk about it. So it's for real that there's a, a paradigm of soil testing that has not necessarily lived up to all of the things that we thought it could do. And I'm one of them. Grew up on a farm, uh, did my master's degree at the University of Saskatchewan, went back to the farm originally to help my dad. And uh, first thing he says is, I bet you're going to want to do soil testing. And I said, yep, sure am. And he said, well, you better look at this uh, file folder. So in the file folder were uh, five years worth of soil tests before I was uh, uh, able to really grasp the concept of management uh, in the 70s. And those five years of soil tests, uh, basically he laid out on the table and pretty much they were all very similar. So his uh, takeaway was, like most people in Western Canada, uh, why bother soil testing? Only 43% in 1995 of prairie farms, so, uh, or 43% didn't soil test at all. 18% soil tested every year, according to the Statistics Canada survey. And then there was a smattering of other, other groups. So it's a fair question to ask, really, is, are, we, are we creating value with that soil test? Because if it was creating value, everybody would be doing it. Now, farmers, you're not alone, because uh, the egg extension industry and, and a lot of other people, even in science, uh, and of course, this is a fairly famous, uh, in my world, um, uh, quote from the Western producer. So are, are soil tests flawed? Uh, yeah, I guess she says they're flawed, uh, but they're also critical. So how can something flawed be critical? Ask yourself, we've been living this almost bipolar situation of, we know that they don't work that well, but we still hold them in high regard. And that high regard is something I'm gonna just take apart a little bit and, and talk about the why it is that we did that and, and where we are now. So the why it is that we did that, obviously, is it was the best we had. Um, it told us things. Um, a more recent survey of why um, people are not soil testing for N every, should say, year missing a little bit. Um, this is a survey from 2015 by the Paul scores. So everybody who had questions about their soil test, uh, you're not alone. There's a, a, a big percentage here that said, I don't think soil tests are that useful. Uh, or they're pretty expensive and to do enough of it to be useful is a problem. Or down here, it's also, I don't trust the soil test results or the one I really like is blame it on somebody else. My advisor says that they're not really that useful. You know, whenever you're trying to talk about the, the ugly step half-sister or brother, it's, uh, it's always best to have somebody else say it. And, and, and this is for real, people. I mean, it's, it was kind of became a um, sacred cow or, you know, like motherhood and apple pie. Who's going to say that soil testing isn't good? Well, in 2009, I was invited to the international meetings of the Soil, and, Soil Science and Plant Analysis uh, Group in Pittsburgh, and their 
single purpose of the symposium was to talk about soil testing in the 21st century. So I, I'm presenting third on the list, but our top presenter, Paul Fixon, whom I've known in the industry for years, uh, was our first presenter, and I expected that he would be talking about soil testing in its standard conventional form with you know a lot of uh, 4R nutrient stewardship and motherhood and apple pie, but he actually knocked my socks off because he was one of the first guys to say, yep, soil testing is what it is and it has some problems. And the problems that with soil testing, we knew from the beginning, but we didn't know what to do with them. So we put some of the problems just up on the shelf, according to Paul Fixon, and I've highlighted a, three of them that I want to kind of take down from the shelf and talk about. One of them is the K-test really doesn't work that well. Has anybody had that experience with their conventional soil tests? Yeah. And sampling fields where banded fertilizer is can really change your soil test. Duh. Yeah. And, of course, before, when conventional soil test was figured out, we didn't band. In the 1950s and 60s, there was a whole raft of different problems that we were trying to solve. So the second most important point I want to deal with today, and maybe the most important point, is how relevant the soil test calibration is. So changes from the 1960s, 50s till today in varieties, in no-till, in all of the rotation impacts are significant and have impacted uh, the validity of some of these historic recommendations. Lastly, and I like this one because Paul Fixon uh, brought it up and, and, and it really is relevant that soil test results were kind of frozen, if you think about it, in, um, from, in time and in space, and they really weren't interpreted well inside of the climate and weather that happens throughout the year. So uh, I went for a small dig in the literature at the University of Saskatchewan, and where's Bobby? Hey, thank you, Bobby, for uh, doing your impersonation of Les Henry, because mine isn't nearly as good, but he's, his name's coming up again, because he was literally one of the granddads that set up this historic soil testing database. So have a look at this. It, it reads like it is, Sask Soil Testing Lab, increasing yield potential or yield response over the check. So that's zero fertilizer added. This is in swift current, and with up to 40, 50, and 60 pounds of ends uh, applied. I have a look here. First off, the soil test database assumed it, that farmers needed a 2.4 to 1 ROI, or they shouldn't apply fertilizer. So if you were applying 40 pounds of N at 10 cents a pound, and you got a 6 bushel per acre response from your check, you would need to be doing that when there's a $1.60 wheat or it was not economic. 30 pounds for $1.40 and 20 pounds for $1.20. So help me understand people, what of this data is even relevant today? So if we added 40 pounds uh, to a stubble field in in um, swift current, we would definitely get more than six bushels out because genetics have changed. Uh, nitrogen is way more expensive than 10 cents a pound. The only thing that's close on an inflation adjustment is the price of wheat. <laughs> Can't go wrong with that joke. So uh, dig a little bit further, go into the plant nutrition research reports and actually I thankfully ran into Les when I was looking this up because he said, Ken, they're all online. So go and dig them out online. So I go online and I look at the 1966 report which rep uh, reported the, the, the crop year. And this particular calibration study is a calibration test for the soil testing lab on stubble land. So remember when 
I mean, when this was done, the preponderance of fields were fallow. There was some stubble, and on stubble land, these were the results from this year. I'm going to highlight number six. Just have a little read of number six. So, on this particular year, ha knowing the soil test number was not valuable in predicting what response to fertilizer was going to happen on that particular year. So this is not a new thing. This was around uh, the, the questions about is soil testing really working started at the beginning. I mean, they were, they were there at the beginning. And here's why. I mean, it's a lot of logic. If we're thinking about a nutrient like nitrogen, and we sample nitrogen at depth, and we compare the nitrogen at depth to what a plant can take up in the, in the total of its biomass. This is work done out of the Dakotas by Ron Gelderman. So take, for example, something like 30 pounds of N in the soil. If this line were really true, that soil N is plant N, then I should find 30 pounds in the plant. Kind of like that point. Except, of course, there's other points like this, right? Where the amount extractable at the time of planting is not close to the whole supply through the growing season. So everyone here has seen that situation for sure. And, and the accounting of the soil test or the mineralization from conventional um, soil tests had never been done. The mineralization of nitrogen gets me way up to 175 pounds of plant uptake when really, you know, I, I shouldn't have gotten there based on what the soil test said, just about 30. So I'm going to take you to a piece of land fly it down south, southern Saskatchewan. Uh, it's land that I managed for a lot of years. This is the year 1992. This is durum wheat. This is durum wheat on fallow. This is durum wheat on fallow, no fertilizer. So background of the image, obviously a totally different durum crop than the, than the front part of the image. This is my standard uh, question for students in class. So what is happening right here at the line? How come it's so different at a line? So it's, I'll tell you the cutest story because I, I was in uh, Lethbridge and at the Lethbridge College and one little gal puts up her hand and says, I think the soil zone changed there. <laughs> Almost correct. Definitely the organic matter did, because this was broke in 1961, this is broke in 1985, this is where the fence line was that all the, the topsoil blew from west to east and deposited in the fence line. And so there was definitely a line there, and it was a line that was affected by the past soil development and uh, accumulation because of erosion. So we know that this exists, we live with it. And, and so too did we know it in the old reports. Here's a report from Asquith. Uh, that same year they were looking at um, uh, a site in um, Asquith, Saskatchewan where the check on breaking was 35 or 33.5 bushel an acre Durham and the fertilized checks were, or fertilized plots were no better. So this is not surprise, this is not, this is not new. This is definitely uh, a piece of the puzzle that we've, that we've known for years. So we'll see if we can get, uh, get the internet to run here. So I put this up to, to think about what were the risks? What were really the risks of being wrong when we were, when we were, um, when we were, Making fertilizer recommendations, I like to put it in the analogy of like making laps with the motorbike, right? So making racing laps back in the 60s, 50s, 40s, man, I mean, they were doing like 
60 kilometers an hour, making those turns. And, you know, if granddad wiped out on a crop, what did he say? Pick the bike up, let's have a ride next year. Right? No problem. We're only losing maybe 40, 50, 60 bucks an acre. We'll just try again next year. And that was a lot of how uh, the risk inside of soil testing or the concern about its accuracy got diluted because the chances of a serious crash were small. I'm going to put this away if I can. And uh, oh yeah, and that's where haul ass actually came from. <laughs> when a motorcycle would haul ass. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this is today. Do you, do you have my volume there, Daryl? Good on you, buddy. So. So this is how we have to ride today. There's no fooling that we have to hit 170 to 180 bucks an acre of inputs, no question. Just turn it down slow, yep. So we're, we're cranking high, high inputs. We're going as fast as we can every turn and we're gonna try not to crash. Because if we crash now, we're dead. So I, I use this as an analogy of, of why um, why the soil testing tools needed to improve. And, and it's, it's pretty interesting. So anybody here ride for, for real? Like, okay, grew up riding a dirt bike like the kids? Okay, so you know, you know it's dangerous. <laughs> but you don't know it's this dangerous. Anybody been to the Isle of Man? Okay, it's on my bucket list. The Isle of Man TT is one of the fastest races, longest races, over 100 plus years it's run. And these guys ride like crazy. Um, interestingly, since the 19, uh, well, 1900s, uh, the, the highest death rates actually happened on this course in the 1970s uh, and 80s. Uh, and then by the 2000s, actually the course um, got safer. But the speeds went up. Any idea why that happened? Because these young guys who are riding the course, they're gaming the system. They're riding that system, they're riding that track in simulation, just like we're seeing here, over and over and over again, memorizing every single, every single turn, every hill, every downshift, every upshift, every break. And because the simulation is so good, they can have memory of that track before they're ever on it. So I bring this up as, a, as, a, as an essential piece of the, of the moving forward. So to move forward from what we're doing in conventional soil testing, we are going to have to, um, we are going to, have to change our paradigm and we are going to have to deal with some of the uh, risk that's out there with a different machine. And I'll, I'll bring up the mechanistic tool that we use and and the studies have been done, well, since, since before um, uh, the soil testing lab in Saskatchewan actually even got started. Uh, Stanley A. Barber, and if you want to learn more about Stan Barber, you can hit that link or, uh, or scan that uh, QR code. Um, now passed, was a very famous Saskatchewan, uh, Saskatchewan farm boy that went on to Purdue University to really take apart the soil plant system mechanistically. He made a machine out of what the soil nutrient supplies could be and what the plant demands needed to be and wrote this book, Soil Nutrient Bioavailability. So to hit the highlights of the book, as time ticks by on us, uh, basically Stan's concept was roots are a sink, nutrients are, are, are being supplied by the soil, are being taken up by the sink, and it's really the rooting volume of each different crop that's setting to the main why plants respond to nutrients or not. So I have to, in his words, think like a root if we're going to actually interpret better what the soil can do. So the soil from the perspective of a root. And that's really where this plant root simulator probe technology comes in. 
that was uh, developed at the University of Saskatchewan by Jeff Shano and Bobby's still in the crowd. Okay, you'll love this one, Bobby. There's Jeff Shano, the very young man in 1992 who uh, is developing this brand new soil test procedure. Yeah, 1992. Like, we've made a few laps with this, people. We know that it runs. And, uh, and, and sadly, it's, it's one of those kind of, I don't know, best kept secrets of there's different ways to get to the same answer when it comes to a soil test. So PRS probes highly sensitive to both temperature and moisture, which is great because so are plants. Um, so what do we do? We get a sample, we incubate it with PRS probes, anions absorbed here, cations here, uh, simple, I'm just going to skip over this one. Uh, we're going to pull those probes out after 24 hours, wash, extract, analyze, get 17 different elements, 12 of which we're going to talk about right now. So I always have to leave time for the real-time demonstration. Um, I'm just gonna find ben here. There we go. So this is out by Vulcan, Alberta. And it's a piece of ground, as you can see, that has some of the similar effects that I had in my field. There's a fence line here. You can see it in the Google Earth image where it's quite a bit uh, greener. Uh, and there's a sandy ridge that runs through here that's quite a bit sandier, and I sampled both. So here's the uh, good area. And the red bars show how much soil supply is to crop barley if I'm growing it with eight inches of water and the soil texture is 37% clay. So I can generate 123 bushel barley, I get 26 pounds from the soil, I have 184 pound demand. So the supply that I have to add as fertilizer costs money. So at 52 cents a pound, putting on less N is actually netting me more profit. I can net more profit by adjusting some of these nutrients, FOSS, pretty flat. I do need a lot of K for my barley, and that's, uh, or, or sorry, sulfur for my barley on this particular uh, piece of ground. Switch over and look at the, uh, the, the sandier piece of ground, vastly different. A, because it's sandy. Oh wait, it's sandy? Well, let's make it sandy. Uh, and uh, where did my 123 bushel yield potential go? Well, less because at five inches of water, a sandy soil cannot generate as much yield potential. I'll need a lot more water to get up there. So all of these factors can be integrated into, a, into an adaptive management system with temperature and moisture, as Paul Fixon indicated, being drivers to the whole system, sure they can. So uh, I know that there's a few people in here. I, w I promised I wasn't going to pick out David, but I'm going to pick him out. There's, there's a couple people in here that I was watching, if you put up your hands, about soil testing sucking, because they're actually using this kind of system to, to figure out what's the best rate of return for each of my fertilizer dollars that I'm spending based on the soil supply and the plant demand. So en end of this, I'm just going to wrap this and give a, a minute or two for questions. So, oops, not that. Yeah, there we go. So Paul Fixon put this together at that same symposium in 2009 and said, you know what we need? We actually need a decision support. Um, saying, yep, Paul, we actually have been running one for about nine years. That bike that we built that we're racing the track with, actually we've made nine laps already. And since then, we've made another 10. So, or I guess nine, it's not quite 2019 yet. So, so we made, you know, total a lot of laps before we ever got to the point of uh, someone else saying, hey, that's, a, that's the kind of feedback system we need where growers can input all these factors, make a decision, come up with an outcome. So my talk ends there with a simple challenge of, you know, it's up to you. You gotta decide your ride. And if you're happy, you know, with the old, 
you know, 1942 Indian, great. That's what it'll get you. And it's a great bike. But, you know, you got to retard the timing before you start it. And, you know, <laughs> you got to prime the carb. And, uh, I mean, this is just stuff you got to do. Uh, or you can ride fast, and you got to. So with that, I'll end on my time and uh, take a question or two. Well, thank you very much, Ken. All right, let's uh, check the crowd for some questions out of that. Uh, so are you saying that the PRS type is a better, is it getting closer to the fast ride in terms of the type of a soil test, or, or do you foresee some new work and some new things being developed in the future? Uh, well, obviously, a bit of a loaded question, but let's answer it anyhow. Clearly, uh, conventional soil testing uh, with extraction methods has a, a bunch of work to do to get to get more relevant. And the question always is, are you going to try and rebuild the whole system, or are you going to take something uh, mechanistic and try and build build the machine, uh, build up a picture of what the future could be? So a simulation system, any which way you cut it, is uh, the only way to really ride the track fast because you, unless you're going to do it by trial and error and I don't know how many people want to, you know, die trying. I mean, that's just the way it is, right? Mm -hmm. We have to have better tools, so. Good. Okay, now we've got a couple of fellows standing by the microphone. Are they asking questions or visiting? Totally visiting. I think they're visiting. Yeah. Okay, just checking. They might have been waiting for, are you, have you got a question? Oh, okay. Got a question? Please. <laughs> Yeah. All right, and then uh, uh, when we think about uh, the the future, can we get a lot more value then? If we can get the, if we can get things there, is there potential to to really jump us to that next level? So uh, to raise the bar uh, from what you're saying, so the simple uh, like the video game analogy, right? So you can go and ride a completely different track that you've never been on. I can go and simulate a crop that I've never grown before and learn a bunch of things before I ever get on it for real, before I ever actually have to take the risks uh, that come along with you know, really going and planting it and really going and fertilizing it. I can learn a lot about how the uh, crop will respond to water, temperature, um, heat, or texture. Those are all things that you, you you can learn ahead, which is, that's the value of advanced decision support systems compared to, you know, sheet of paper, recommendation, conventional soil test. That just, they're just two different things. It's like playing a board game or, you know, riding in a simulator of any sort, right? A lot more fun in the simulator, for sure. Thank you. Here's your card. Thank you very much, Thank Ken. You. We appreciate you taking the time. That's right. Give him a hand. <laughs>